Welcome everyone. Welcome to Global Health Tuesday. Today we're going to be hearing uh, a lecture entitled Holistic Healing Within Community, Global Mental Health Perspectives During COVID-19. And I'm really proud um, to be um, sharing this with you today. This represents a um, three or four year partnership that the Global Health Institute has had with a network of mental health um, practitioners. My name is Laurie Dupreet Brown, and I'm the Associate Director of the Global Health Institute. And I'm really um, happy to welcome you today. Um, we're going to be hearing about some from some members of our community. It's wonderful to see so many uh, folks joining. And I'll be telling you about some ways that you can make coming to our webinars a regular part of your life. We've got a great um, lineup coming. Um, but first, we're going to do something really important, and I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to share um, a land acknowledgement with you um, that is, it's a practice that we have um, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and it might be new for some of you, and so I'll just say that um, it's in the spirit of really decolonizing our perspectives and recognizing the way that colonialism um, has impacted us. So many of you are signing on from Africa. You understand the colonial experience. Sometimes we forget about the colonial history um, in Wisconsin. And so with that, I'm gonna share a, a form of this land acknowledgement that was developed some, uh, from some of my students from the Native Nations Working Group. So these are students who um, are from indigenous communities and um, prepared a statement that they thought would be meaningful to open our events. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancest ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called Dijok since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. Please, let's all take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths every day. This is particularly meaningful as we think about global mental health. When we think about historical and intergenerational trauma, we are referring to some of the mental health impacts of the history described here. So I'm really, um, I hope that, you know, we'll be making those connections as we hear the lecture today. Um, now, now I'm going to uh, share a little bit about um, the upcoming programs of the Global Health Institute. Here, um, upcoming soon on April, April 8th, the 4W Initiative, of which I'm the director, that stands for Women, Wellbeing, and Wisconsin in the World, has a, a three-day program related to gender change and the arts. There are many uh, aspects to it, but I wanted to feature one thing that you might be interested. And this is called um, Shifting the Center, and it's featuring with writers from, um, from FemRight, which is the Ugandan Writers Association. And Hilda Twangerwe and Reddy uh, Kyomohendu are well-known writers in Wisconsin who will be talking about the lived experience of women. Much of that does have a you talk about mental health and, and, and resilience, and it's going to be a very powerful session. We also, on April 14th, will be hearing from Marilena Huambachano as our keynote in the, in the annual Global Health Symposium. Uh, Dr. Huambachano is a faculty member in the School of Human Ecology and uh, has been working with the Global Health Institute on this seminar. And this is going to be featuring um, fostering resilience through indigenous women, uh, wisdom. She particularly focuses on food systems and food, food sovereignty. Um, and with that, um, I will stop sharing and I'd like to introduce our panel um, to you now.
the um, the first um, the first speaker that you'll be hearing from today is um, it looks like it's going to be Dr. Fred Coleman, and he's a clinical faculty member at the UW Department of Psychiatry. And he has a long history of supporting community-based mental health care. He's worked with the Hmong refugee population, the Cambodian refugee population around um, the state and country. And he's been a leader and participant in some of the networks that we'll be talking about today. We'll also be hearing um, from Dr. Sebastian Sejempija, and he's a licensed psychologist, and he's the CEO. Many of me who are, who are in the Milwaukee area may know Sebastian Family Psychology Practice. So he's a graduate of Marquette. He's an immigrant from Uganda, and he not only provides quality mental health care in the Milwaukee area, he also leads consultations and conferences aimed at increasing awareness about mental health um, in, in Eastern Africa and especially Uganda. We'll also hear from Dr. Hafsa Lukwata Sentogo, who joins us from Uganda, and she's a physician with a medical training from Mbara University, postgraduate training um, from the Nagasaki University in Japan, and a master's degree from the Makareri University um, School of Public Health. She right now is the acting head of the Mental Health and the Control of Sus Substance Abuse Division in the, in the um, Ugandan Ministry of Health. And she has extensive care in medical care, pediatric care, infectious disease, emergency response, not only COVID, but um, she was a seasoned veteran of the Ebola crisis. So we know we're in good hands when we're getting advice from Dr. Hafsa about, about current matters. Um, Dr. Timothy El uh, Ellinger, who will also be presenting, and he's an associate professor of systems change and peace building at the UW-Milwaukee UW Master of Sustainable Peace Building Program. And he explores the implications of policies on ecosystem services and how that affects health, human well-being, and conflict. Um, so we're going to be hearing um, from Dr. Sebastian first. And this, um, this partnership began with a learning exchange in, in um, June of uh, 20, 2017, I believe. And so now we here we've come a few years later, and we're going to hear about just what's happened um, in those partnerships. And with that, Dr. Sebastian, I will pass the mic to you. Welcome. Please unmute and Dr. Sebastian will be greeting you and then we'll be preparing a slide present, sharing a slide presentation as well. Good morning, Dr. Lori. Good morning, our team. Good morning, my co-presenters. Good afternoon for those of you listening to us from other parts of the world, especially uh, Africa. And uh, thank you for such a, an important introduction. Uh, and we, are, we thank you for your connection and the leadership at GHI uh, for making this possible. I'm going to be counting on uh, uh, Debbie helping me with my PowerPoints here. Uh, I don't know if they are, I can begin to show them. I'm having, I need to apologize. I'm having trouble connecting on the Zoom link from my laptop. So I'm using my phone. So let me it see how best. Thank you very can. well. And I think Debbie's about to start the slide. So it should go smoothly. Or, or Logan, I believe. Is going to start Thank you. And so, I also want to acknowledge and be grateful to our, my, co, my, my co-leaders, my friends, uh, Dr. Coleman. Excuse me, I just want to do a little correction on the slides. Dr. Sanjampija has joined us, so it will be his slide presentation, Logan, that we'll use. He joined just, just before I did the introduction, so okay. we'll just take one moment yeah. because it is better to begin at the beginning with Dr. Sanjay Pija's wonderful leadership. Thank you, here we go. Thank you so much. Um, again, I do want to be grateful and uh, for this particular moment and to indicate that I, I want to share this discussion in the spirit of relationships and how those relationships uh, connectivity as we understand it now, but in an, in an older version that friendships have been the beginning and also the continuation of how things get done. So today I want to share how our agency, Sebastian Family Psychology Practice, 
an agency that I, I'm co-founder with and also my wife Yvonne, we are co-founders and the co-directors, has worked very closely with the Uganda Behavioral Health Alliance, which I will reference at UBHA, as part of the be beginning building blocks that eventually put together the coalition of friendships and connections that have made possible what we know now as our uh, you, our local and global mental health connection. So David, let's go to the next. So I do, um, in this understanding, a little bit about our history, uh, I'm pleased to share with you here uh, my, my, my significant other and also a co-plotter, if I can use that word in a meaningful way, co-founder of our Sebastian Family Psychology Practice and also um, co-leader in our efforts, both in local and global mental health. Our agency, Sebastian Family Psychology Practice, has been in practice now well over 28, 30 years. I, I do lose count because I, we enjoy our work 98% of the time. The other 2% are when we have to deal with peril and the costs that come with those challenges. But otherwise, the privilege to serve in this community right here in Wisconsin has been an infinite uh, experience of great joy and the response to, call the, to the call to serve. As an agency, we now have about 45 clinicians who include psychiatrists, uh, psychologists, master's level licensed psychotherapists, master's level trainees, PhD uh, trainees that are coming into the workforce to contribute to the Wisconsin and hopefully to the national behavioral health workforce. But in the course of doing that work over these three decades, we realized that our own country of origin, Uganda, also had a significantly important need. And that need could not be hidden from us as we realized very quickly when we would travel that the cause to respond to questions about mental health, loved ones being sick at the hospital, children suffering from emotional challenges, children having trouble falling and remaining asleep, families struggling with relationship issues because of conflict, schools where you have principals, administrators wanting to do a good job with their students, but are struggling to see that very smart and able students are failing not because they cannot con understand the information, but their minds, their hearts, their well-being was affected by worries, by anxiety, by terrible dreams. We were getting connections and contacts from, co from workers, from employers and employees struggling with understanding why job productivity was affected by people that otherwise were very able, but could not concentrate all of a sudden they could not have the energy to show, to show up on time or to be at their work. Uh, for, uh, uh, men and women at work having challenges with their, emotion, their emotional health, trying to make a connection why psychological well-being could indeed have a huge impact on work and productivity. We were getting the same concerns from various faith community leaders from different uh, denominations also wondering about what is happening to the nation. And so all of these connections uh, and concerns, including politicians, uh, law enforcement folks, who are realizing that our, our country as that at that time was recovering from a, a long and sustained civil war was struggling with these things. So in an effort to understand this, uh, David, let's go to the next PowerPoint as we, want to connection, connect. Uh, so in an effort to understand this, we asked ourselves that how can we, as a clinic, continue to do good work right here in Wisconsin by providing very uh, mental health to children, to families, in a collaboration with, with hospitals, in a collaboration with schools, in a collaboration with local government, in a collaboration with the state government to, to take care of our, uh, our, our clients that were uh, entrusted to us. We knew very well 
that as we worked with uh, refugees and immigrants from different parts of the world, right here in Wisconsin, we knew that their concerns, their worries, uh, while trying to reestablish life here, were very real right here in Wisconsin, right here in the United States. But they were always also similarly concerned, just like Yvonne and I were concerned about our people, our communities in Uganda. And therefore, the need to establish then a connection. And that's why we had to care not only about Uganda, but Africa and the role of medical and mental health delivery. Let's go to our next one. So this effort, again, through friendships, we were compared to uh, through cups of coffee, cups of tea, we were always checking with friends. We, were, we figured out that we would rely on our friends that we know, my coworkers that I have done service with here, right in Wisconsin, and we co-founded what is now known as the Uganda Behavioral Health Alliance, or UBHA, where the board were really my friends, were social workers, lawyers, psychiatrists, uh, corporate retirees, uh, wanting to, to do good, not only here, but also abroad. And so we designed a, pl a plan where a partnership between professionals on the, in the USA would work closely with professionals in Uganda in an equal partnership and level of collaboration to see that we uh, understand the issues affecting medical delivery and mental health challenges. And so we had our first inaugural conference in 2012 and we were hosted by the University of Kisubi, uh, which has and continues to be a very proud uh, academic home for us. And so in doing that, that first conference, which was uh, in 2012, was attended by 12, by 75 people from across the country. And we intentionally wanted to not only to invite psychiatrists, physicians, nurses, but interdisciplinary folks from educators to employ employers, from faith leaders of different sects to uh, fathers and mothers, to, uh, to patients who had been and who are going through medical and mental health services, to teams that were working on the streets with the homeless, with the addicted, and so that collaboration was from the beginning intended not to be just an academic uh, audience, but an interdisciplinary audience that brought together people whose mission and vision was to see to the well being of our teens. And so, in that sense, we knew that we had to have a good relationship working with the Minister of, of Health in Uganda. And we were, so, we were so proud then and now to see that the directors of the mental health division in the Minister of, of Health in Uganda were on our side, that they understood. In the beginning, it was Dr. Shiran Dianabanji, whom unfortunately we lost to uh, cancer in uh, 2018. And just before she uh, left, that's before we, we left, we lost her. She did introduce for us then and now our good friend, our leader, Dr. Hafsa uh, Rukwara, who is the, uh, uh, whom Dr. Uh, Lori has referenced. And so that relationship enabled us to have not only the government's uh, um, involvement, but the private sector as well. We worked closely with the local uh, and the only national referral hospital at Butabika and its different uh, psychiatric units in the different hospitals across the country working well together. And so in those relationships, again, relying on friendships, we were able to, begin to host our conference in 2012. Our next one was in 2014. Our third one was in 2017, at which, and here I'm pleased again to share, uh, could you, uh, David, just let's go to the next one. We had then our friendships that are, had been developing for a long time uh, with Dr. Fred Coleman, who uh, is a colleague, a friend, and also a dedicated uh, member of this team who had been very close to our office work in regard to serving refugees. He came to serve with us in first in 2017, then in 2018, 2019, and 2020, last year, 
uh, through a virtual presence, but also a consistent and sustained involvement. Uh, along with that was also the friendships we had built with Dr. Timothy Alinga at the University of Wisconsin right here in Milwaukee, um, whereby we were able to acknowledge and uh, share uh, with his team working with the Masters in Sustainable Peace Building, uh, his collaboration and support, uh, and also involvement in the planning and implementation of the, uh, the of now the then uh, East Africa Conference. Sorry. Um, so with with Dr. Arling and his friends and his students and his program, we expanded that effort. Now somewhere, and I will rely on Dr. Coleman's memory here, I think in 2017 or 2018, Dr. Coleman did introduce us to Dr. Laurie and then through Dr. Laurie uh, with her team at the Global Health Institute, the School of Nursing, that relationship expanded uh, with a, a, a seminar in, um, uh, on Global Health Institute and leadership where mental health was into, first introduced and we had a guest that coming in from Uganda at that time and then the following year, I believe in 2019, we had three scholars coming from Africa, which, which did include Dr. Hafsa, Dr. Dr. Tunde, and Dr. Bashir. And so fast forwarding to where we are now, uh, that the conference in East Africa pretty much became now not only an East African component, but indeed a global com 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 component where people that were very dedicated to the cause of mental health within the interdisciplinary uh, formula and forum that we have created, mm -hmm. did uh, hold a virtual conference last October, uh, on October 5th and 6th, where we had 12 sites pretty much involving different parts of Africa, the, the UK, and right here in the Mid 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 Midwest, the East West, the Eastern part of, uh, part of the US and also Japan and made possible the conference that we were able to hold. We remain very hopeful, but very dedicated to the fact that through these friendships that we have created, we have a, an opportunity to grow together, to learn together, and to look at mental health, not only as a one discipline, but one that has to work collaboratively with other disciplines as well. We are pleased to see that through a training, we are now able to educate uh, people globally, and share in a common cause in the service of, the, of humanity. COVID-19, with all its difficulties, has made these possibilities much more realistic, even as we may have challenges. I'll stop there and then go over to my friend, Dr. Uh, Coleman, to share the framework within which we have been organizing our work. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Thank you, Dr. Laurie. And I hope you are able to hear me well. Good morning, all. It's good to be with you today. My PowerPoint will be up shortly. What we are going to talk about is the invitation I got from Dr. Simpesia in 2017 to bring as a person who had spent 30 years clinically working primarily cross-culturally with Southeast Asian refugees to looking at the US African experience and to start with an academic model, then the growth of that model as we had an intersection of cultures, and then an application of that model to a particular area of concern for dealing with COVID-19. Next slide, please. No conflicts to disclose. Next slide. The biopsychosocial model coined by George Engel in 1977 was an attempt to move away from simplistic biologic models that all we are as humans is a body or a brain to be treated medically and further to move away from the simplistic mind body model that we are just an either or mind and body. His model of biopsychosocial has been thought of both as a theory of causation, where do health problems come from? It has been thought of as a theory of levels of organization of thinking. 
But most importantly, it opened up the notion that we could step into, notice the medicalization, a patient's eyes and see the world. Next slide. But as we began to do the intersection work between those of us from the West and those from Africa, we noted how important culture and spirituality were. <clears throat> you have a brief definition of culture here, noticing that these terms include both things that we understand as social constructs and others that are observable in different ways, but also the spiritual, a center for moral or religious understanding, an awareness of the sacred in life, and understanding a person's deepest feelings and beliefs that give meaning to their life. Next slide. You can think in two different ways, one more Western, one more African. One way of thinking is that the inner circle is the cultural and spiritual and the outer circle is the person. That is in the individualistic West, we think of the person as the ultimate element and the spiritual or cultural is one facet within a person. Next slide. In this sense, the person is the container. The self has intelligence, emotions, history. The self experiences things in the spiritual area. And the person may say, part of who I am is my faith, tradition, or experience of the spiritual or religious. Next slide. But you can also think of the outer circle, the larger container as the cultural and spiritual, and the inner circle as the person. Next slide. Then one experiences reality that all is in the domain of the cultural and spiritual. The self exists within that reality. The person may say, all that I am, think, do, and experience is God's, or whatever phrasing they give to the spiritual. All is one. I am part of the one that is all. There is no sense of an individual apart from being a member of one's culture and the broader world of meaning of the spiritual. Next slide. So now we're going to take you to some location. While in 2017, we introduced this model and the intersection of models led us to broaden our understanding and work with the cultural and religious background of all participants from all of the countries involved. In 2019, we began to look at resilience principles and the older biologic models might've looked at resilience just in terms of the fitness of the body, the fitness of the brain, the need for human touch. Note how important that is in today's COVID-19 time. I spoke with a colleague whose family was far away in the country who had been working only on telehealth, who realized that it had been one year since she had embraced another human being, since she had had physical contact with another and the awareness of how that had affected her own personal health. We also have the psychological realm. Three categories are brought forward here and the social realm, but adding particularly and emphasizing the cultural and spiritual realm, we began to talk about notions of the moral compass. In the midst of COVID-19, we have been affected by what is described as moral injury, the failure of institutions to be prepared and to provide adequate care, failures in leadership in countries across the world to reduce harm and suffering adequately. Secondly, we face issues of meaning and purpose. How does facing a pandemic 
bring us back to what the purpose of our own lives is. And finally, whether we are religious, part of a tradition where we worship in some way, or our spiritual, understanding what is broader than ourselves, less in a specific institutional framework, but more in an experiential framework. Each of these has been very important to us. So you see here a model for resilience thinking adapted from the book Resilience by Southwick and Charney with additions that grew out of our work together in the projects between the US and Africa. But now holding this in mind, move to the second slide after this, the Reclaim model. Dr. Karambu Ringera of International Peace Initiatives developed an Afrocentric Kenyan originating model. She has here a series of one word pieces, each of which she expands on in length. But I'd like to highlight number two and number five. We in the West have often talked about empowerment. Note, however, the power claim in there. If I empower you, it is me doing something to you. But Dr. Ringera pushed us to look at empoweredness, which is the recognition in each other person that the center of their power is within themselves. And that to be resilient, to survive a pandemic, to recover, to flourish means being aware of one's own power and not having others take over, colonize the country, the mind, the body of another, but respect their power to be. And number five, adjustiveness. Often when we talk about adjustment in Western medicine or psychology, we have a model in our mind of what a person should be, how they should adjust, what they should do. Notice all the shoulds in that. Dr. Ringera talks about adjustiveness as an individual, familial, and cultural quality, which emerges to adapt to new circumstances. So part of the richness of the model as it's continued to develop in our shared work is this interplay, which has led all of us to be more clear about culture and spirituality and to be more clear about the strength of each person, family, group, clan to face things like the pandemic. So with that, I will pass the torch on the last slide. Thank you very much. We'll be open for questions later and we'll move on to other colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. The next two presenters are presenting via video because of, you know, we anticipate sometimes um, problems with technology. And um, my colleague Logan is loading those. We'll be hearing first from Dr. Hafsa. And as you remember, she played a real a leadership role in the Ministry of Health in Uganda. And I just wanna, you know, underscore as we move to the second half, this community has done such powerful original thinking. And um, our part, the partnership with the Global Health Institute has been real two-way learning in the learning exchanges that we've hosted. And Dr. Hafsa um, was generous enough to come and spend three weeks with us a few years ago and gave some very powerful lectures um, that are available online. So with that, Logan, perhaps you can um, start Dr. Hafsa's presentation. Or Debbie. No, Debbie's playing it. Yeah, sorry. I'm going to encourage everyone to please turn your own volume to the maximum volume. That will allow you to hear this well. Um, and I had to, you will all have to do that. So turn your volume up and please post questions in the chat from all these presentations because we'll be taking a few at the end. Dr. Hafsa, welcome. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. 
um, Dr. Hafsa Lukwata, the Acting Assistant Commissioner, Mental Health and Control of Substance Abuse here at the Ministry of Health in Uganda. Uh, it gives me a lot of pleasure to have this opportunity to present to you. My topic is holistic healing in the community during COVID time. It is such a wonderful um, topic for discussion because um, many times as health workers, we never think about uh, the other aspects of care other than what we provide within the, within the health facilities. Yet we know that uh, for holistic care, it requires or it considers the whole person, the body, the mind, the spirit, and emotions. And it caters for both the clinical and the non-clinical interventions that ultimately lead to better physical and mental health outcomes. Uh, we know that the medicines will not do everything, but many times we need to relate with other people. We need to think through what is happening around us. We need to you know, do a little more than just the chemicals that we are putting into the body. So it ultimately promotes care within the community where people, like where someone resides, where they work. So there are quite a number of interconnections in there, which we need to really work on. And uh, yeah, so I feel that, the I mean, when we are caring for people, we really need to think through this process and, uh, and appreciate the different uh, ramifications that are available in people's lives. I thought through what causes people to have issues, what has caused people to have issues during this COVID time. And, uh, and we know that it is mainly, there are quite a number of reasons and they are just, we can just break them into two. Uh, we are having issues around the disease itself that is COVID-19, whether someone is, is affected directly or indirectly with contacts and other family members. But then there are other issues that is around mm, the consequences of, of the COVID consequential, meaning like a death of a loved one or the infection of a family member, which is not necessarily touching the person, but it's you know the second hand, the second person in there. Uh, we have lots of um, uh, fear about death as, as individuals. We fear the health of the contacts. We fear you know, stigma, there's a lot of stigma that was surrounding uh, the COVID uh, infection. We have a uh, lack of basic needs because of some reason or the other, people have had to, you know, lack, not because they don't have the money, but sometimes the shops are closed or like the person who is supposed to provide the care is not available or whatever. So there's been that uh, break into, in uh, the break in, in the supply of basic needs. Uh, We've had cases where um, we've had lots of gender-based violence. This has been a big issue and causing a lot of unrest and distress to people. And uh, whoever comes out of such a situation would really have to heal or would be taken through quite a lot of processes to enable them heal. Then there were movement restrictions. Many people had plans for 2020. And uh, we know that, of course, most of these plans were we are put to a halt due to the movement restrictions. We just lost our opportunity to meet again. We meet, you know, the, 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 the East African conference, we missed that one. Anyway, plus so many other things that we've been able to miss because of the movement restrictions. Then, of course, there are those that are direct. I've talked about the direct ones where someone is really sick and, uh, you know, they are very lonely. They are staying in, uh, in isolation, in some form of quarantine. And this makes people very very, very uncomfortable and require to be, treat, to be treated and, 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 and cared for. So what has the community done? What is the role of the community? Uh, for us in our country here, we found it as it is double-edged. The effects have been double-edged in that on one side, they have provided a supportive role, but on the other, we've actually perpetrated even further distress and unrest to the people. That are, that are within that community. So if I just start on the positive side of things, our community, many people have, have stood against all odds and helped others during the burial ceremonies. And we 
in our place, there's a lot of announcements that have to be made. Uh, we have to go through prayers, people do a lot of prayers, they could be singing, they could be, you know, praying together with the bereaved family. Then there is uh, management of the grave, people really who are out there to help with, uh, you know, digging the grave and, and you know, preparing generally for the, for the burial. Then after, of course, the burial, there have been issues around bereavement support that one has been provided, quite a number of people would come in and support the, fa the family members who have lost a loved one with food, with shelter, with security, they keep them around and really manage to, you know, keep them a bit safe and, and, and happy. We've had other uh, types of care, usually at the community. Currently, we are having a, a strategy for home-based care. And in here, people are being cared for within their communities and uh, it's what we call teletherapy. We have, uh, we have uh, taken on teletherapy and uh, people are called on phones for either treatment or counseling or, you know, whatever. So this somehow makes someone feel as if, you know, they are being helped and they are being cared for. Although very far, but although the care could be very far, but at least giving an, is offering an opportunity for someone to be treated within their communities and cared for from there. Then of course, there are some material uh, support that can be provided or that has been provided by many community members. In case someone is unwell, they would offer them care, like because they know that since if someone is unwell, then they have to remain in isolation or quarantine. So the material, the, the, the material support has been provided by some family members from within the communities, even some friends. Then of course, as a community, we have some cultural, some are cultural, some are just because of what is happening. We've shared lots of information on the kind of care that can be given to people who are unwell. Uh, we call them home remedies. People are, are steaming, we are using local hubs. And uh, once someone has a, a source of a local hub, they'll, they'll share it with the other members of the community. So there's been a lot of sharing and, 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 and being together. So just like I said, the community can, it, it, it can be a bad thing as well. So on that side of being so terrible, uh, we've had disruptions in the supportive structures within many communities where people were no longer, irrespective of who you are, if you're a family member and somehow you're sick, that's to, to, to stay on your own. And then no one will come to you, no one will get closer to you. And you know, this one causes a lot of, of stress to, to uh, the, the person who is being, who's going through this. Uh, the other thing is stigma and discrimination. We've had issues where communities can 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 deny or can really um, stigmatize a person who has had a positive test of COVID. So, and this has even been worse for people with mental illness, where already they are being stigmatized. So once they even have a mental, I mean, once they have even COVID, it makes it even more terrible. So there's been lots of, of, of stigma and discrimination within communities, and this is perpetrated by just the members of the, of the community. Then we've had cases where people have resorted to substance abuse. You know, people are redundant, they are, they are not working, they are not working anymore. And once someone gets an opportunity to get like alcohol, maybe actually alcohol has been one of the biggest abused uh, uh, substance. So people have abused drugs, people, com people can uh, share they would, they would fail to, pay, to share food, but share the substance of abuse because they know that it's very difficult to come by and they know they want to share with others. So it has been a big, big issue down here, uh, here back home in Uganda, where substances have been abused at a communal level. Then of course, the gender-based violence, I've talked about the gender-based violence, and this one can be from within the families where we've seen many fathers, unfortunately, abusing their daughters, abusing their, 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 their wives and you know, other members of the family, or other, even other male, 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 male members of the family. But it can also be from outside. We have seen where children have been raped by other people from around the communities. And this is very, this is, I've been mentioning the negative side. So all in all, just to be, like, just to summarize, we have found that the community can have can have two faces in care. They can make it worse for the person who is suffering, but on the good side, they can also make it better. 
uh, one thing that COVID has done is that it has broken the moral fabric, it has broken that supportive, you know, structures that have we've always had as, 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 as Ugandans, as Africans, and somehow there's a lot of fear. There's been a lot of fear until lately when the, when the, when the fear is going down because of the, the reduced number of cases. So we feel that, yes, the community has a role to play because uh, people again have to heal. They need to forgive each other. We need to understand each other within the community. But once this does not happen, then of course healing does not happen. I just want to emphasize that when it comes to the people with mental illness, it becomes even more difficult because they're already rejects within their communities. So having a mental illness and, and, a, and a COVID diagnosis has made it a very terrible uh, situation for those people that are suffering. First of all, they lack the medicines. They have nowhere to pick their medicine, but most importantly, they are double, there's uh, that uh, double, um, problem of being denied the basic needs and where to and the support that was initially available. Thank you very much for listening to me. And, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Hafsa. Your leadership has been amazing. And we've we've seen when you were here during um, the 2019 exchange, you know, there was an Ebola outbreak going on at, at home and yet you were here learning and sharing and advocating for community health. And once again, you've just kind of ground truthed the situation for us because community is where the healing happens. It's where the harm happens too. And we really have to, um, we really have to fight if dignity and community um, are going to, are going to win here. So thank you for that. We're going to turn now to a final presentation. And um, I will ask um, Debbie to load it up uh, by Dr. Tim Ellinger. And the first presentation you heard about the network and how it's come together, putting an online conference was a huge thing. This was one of the best early adapter online conferences that was had. And then you heard about the model, you heard about what it means for praxis, what it means to leaders. And now Tim is gonna talk really about, you know, how do we move forward as a learning community to, um, to create a future and to optimize the power of these networks. And that's really fits with his expertise around resilience and peace building and, and building transformation. So with that, um, welcome Tim, Dr. Ellinger. Good morning. My name is Tim Ellinger with the Institute for Systems Change and Peace Building at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. I want to share this morning a few of the ideas and reflections on work that I've been involved with in East Africa, working with colleagues on community resilience, uh, community health and well being, and using systems thinking as a way to cultivate adaptive learning communities. Much of what I'm going to talk about today builds off of the work of Dr. Kurambu Ringera. Dr. Rangera is the founder of International Peace Initiatives in Meru, Kenya. IPI began as an initiative to build an orphanage for the children of women suffering from HIV AIDS, but over 10 years has grown and expanded to develop programming in community health and wellness, education, economic entrepreneurship, leadership, sustainable agriculture, and gender equity throughout East Africa and beyond. I've been fortunate to get to know Dr. Ringera, and what I'd like to talk about today is comparing and contrasting some of the different ways that we look at the concepts of resilience and how we can learn from each other as a way of sort of broadening the approach to engaging communities to develop the capacity to be truly resilient and truly holistic in engaging health and wellness. A solid place to start when looking at resilience are the seven resilience thinking principles of the Stockholm Resilience Center. The first three listed here are around managing and maintaining diversity and redundancy, connectivity, and the feedbacks among slow variables within the system. The next two are around our mental models and 
how we cultivate the understanding of the system as a complex adaptive system that changes over time and related to that encourage learning and experimentation within the system. And lastly, the remaining two are about engaging the community both in terms of broadening participation within the system and promoting a decision or a governance structure that's polycentric uh, throughout the system, allowing it to adapt quickly and to learn at the local level. These seven principles resonated with me as my practice as a restoration ecologist developed over the past decades, in part because it uh, really confirmed what I had learned in my own work about the success of projects that I had had less to do with the cutting edge uh, nature of the research I was doing on uh, ecology, but had more to do with the uh, effectiveness or the extent to which we built adaptive learning communities with the communities engaged with our projects. The process we employ in the Institute for Adaptive Learning is reflected in this following figure. At the core, we place trust, relationship, equity, and emergence. These values are founded upon the fundamental principle that systems change at the speed of relationships and that those relationships form at the speed of trust. And if trusting relationships are developed, then equity can be established among the different participants in the system, which then allows for a culture that embraces emergence and adaptive learning. So that as we go through projects, as we go through programs, as we develop policies and implement them, the activities that occur around those values need to be reflected and feedback into that central core. So for example, in processes that involve participatory visioning within the community, connecting people, perspectives, and purpose, always paying attention to those core four principles. When we engage in participatory systems mapping to co-create shared understanding, the projects again are addressing the issues at the core. After that systems understanding gets used to look for leverage opportunities or to co-design strategic interventions, attention again to the way that that activity feeds into those cores of trust, relationship, equity, and emergence. When those designs become coordinated enough to align for action, the assets and collective action must be done in such a way, again, that pays attention to those core values and principles. Similarly, when it's time to monitor and evaluate and ask the questions as to what is changing and why it's changing, how does that then get fed into that central core? And lastly, as the process returns back to the beginning, what can we learn and how can we adapt based upon the lessons that have been accumulated and brought throughout the process? Of course, in real world complex systems, these never operate or occur in sequence going around. Many parts of them can be going on at the same time and they overlap in space and time. But by holding that central set of principles in the middle, it operates as a self-organizing system that allows these different parts to stay connected so that the self-organizing can occur within a structured framework. I want to step back and switch gears away from talking about resilience and adaptive learning and focus on the way Dr. Karambu talks about her work using the acronym RECLAIM. And reclaiming is something that you apply both within yourself, you apply in your relationships with others, and apply with your broader community in the world. RECLAIM is an acronym. The first R stands for responsibility, your sense of uh, really acknowledging your agency in the world. The second is E for empoweredness. Empowerment is something someone does for you or to you. Empoweredness is what you do with the power that you're given. C is for courage, the willingness to stand for what you believe in and the person you are. 
L is for love and light, seeing the light within you and the love that moves through all within and around you. A is for adjustiveness. Adjustiveness is the capacity to recognize when a battle, it's not worth fighting. She talks about uh, a river when it's flowing down from the mountains to the sea, it does not stop to discuss with the rock whether the rock would move out of its way. The river just flows around the rock, rubs up against it, and maybe over time wears it away. I is for intuition, trusting the wisdom within you, recognizing that we all carry wisdom of the ages within us and being able to know when and how to trust that inner, that inner voice. And M is for mindfulness, doing this all within the context of really a reflective practice of awareness and being mindful of yourself, your world, and your positionality within that world. Reclaim is, in my mind and in my words, what I oftentimes think of as resilience uh, from her perspective and within her contexts. The reclaimed values and process form the core of much of Dr. Kurambu's work. One program that draws upon them extensively is the Now Generation Leaders Program, or NGL for short. NGL attracts young people from across East Africa to workshops and events that use the Reclaim Dialogue as a method for developing a community, a learning community for character-driven leadership. NGL follows the process of asking questions around the Reclaim principles. Questions such as, who am I? To analyze and assess based upon those questions and dialogues with other NGL participants. Asking questions about barriers, about what's in my way. Asking questions about, am I responding or reacting? Do I need a new mindset? What is my story? Is it my story or a story that someone else is telling for me? Who do I work with? Who becomes a partner with me along the path? Who do I choose to be with and who chooses to be with me? Embracing emergence, that my self is not static but continuously becoming, and that this evolving presence requires reflection and learning, that I must take time to reflect and have that as part of my essence, and then taking that back and feeding it into the process of continual learning and developing my dialogue. With that, building that upon knowledge, building that upon engagement, building that upon network, being willing to speak and to seek facts and to use those facts in terms of becoming the leader that you were born to be. There are some striking differences and powerful similarities between the resilience framework and the reclaim philosophy. One built upon participatory governance and process, the other founded upon story and dialogue, both of which involve a profoundly important role for learning and adaptive emergence. And when looked at together, clearly point to a value of the work of bringing the East African and Wisconsin communities together as part of the East African Behavioral Health Alliance work. I look forward to having the opportunity to talk more with you about this at some future time. I apologize for being double booked today, but would welcome uh, any contact or communication at, at a later time. Thank you. Goodbye. I want to give um, th thank Tim Ellinger very much for sharing those um, those comments. And I just we're we're nearing the end of an hour, and our speakers are available to continue with Q and A. Uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna share um, a summative uh, element of the workshop with you very briefly because it's a I know when we hear these stories, people are very interested in what can I do next, and we do conceive of this work as having a strong um, a strong um,
call to action. Right now, I seem not to be able to have access to seeing the comments or the um, screen. So if, if Logan could share um, briefly the call to action, that would be great. And um, I'm hoping that someone can give me access to the chat to see the questions. But we do have, um, we did prepare a call to action that you can sign on and join. And what we said is, you know, we really need to unlock mental health care. Um, and this was written before COVID, but when you listen to what these experts were able to think about, it really prepares us for COVID. People like Dr. Sebastian and Dr. Hafsa, it's not like, oh, now they have to do their work in an emergency. They're accustomed to doing the work in the emergency. They've survived, you know, the AIDS epidemic a scourge on communities, the Ebola, and many more uh, other things that are not health related. So here we have this call to action. It's called Unlocking Mental Health Care. And we said, you know, we heard there's no health without mental health. And all families, that means mine and yours, will need welcoming access to quality mental health care and psychosocial support. We need that access at all times because that's, you know, it's part of family and community life. Um, this need is universal and effective strategies for health system and community-based prevention are known and can be made available. There's a huge no-do gap here. People at this workshop were sharing things they know worked. It's not that we don't have any ideas about what to do. There is a need for discovery, but there's more a need to make the decision to treat people with dignity and do what we know works and be that community, as Dr. Hafsa said, that heals rather than harms, right? And so the third thing is we can and should, we can and should help all families to live and prosper by unlocking mental health care. At this time, think about your family and what might be happening, what you've lived through. I have students who've, who are mentioning, you know, shame about talking about someone who died of COVID because people assume, you know, that they, they did so out of carelessness. So we have a lot of issues in relation to COVID um, that taps this, but we're looking at global leaders in government and social institutions, religious organizations, the caring professions, all to take a new look at our work and to infuse it with dignity and care. So at the, at the end, what we really heard from the group was that unlocking mental health care puts a stop to shackling, imprisonment, separation, and exclusion, and replaces these inhumane responses with effective care respect for human rights and personal dignity. And this, this happens in community. Um, and that's, that's kind of the front line um, for this care. And so with that, um, I don't know if there are questions. And so I'm, I've heard that there aren't questions right now. We are going to make these slides available. We appreciate your attendance and you can reach out to us. I'd like to give um, Dr. Sebastian a chance to just say some some final words for us as we as we open you know this work rather than closing a seminar of unlocking mental health care um, through the behavioral health care alliance work. Thank you, Dr. Lori and the, your team at the GHI. Thank you, Dr. Coleman, for your beautiful presentation. Thank you, my friends, Dr. Alinga and Dr. Hafsa, for your videotaped work. Thank you, Debbie, uh, for hosting us on this virtual format. And thank you all in attendance today at an important juncture in our lives. It's important to note that it's been a year uh, this month that uh, we have come to grips with what COVID-19 has done to us and to the entire world. That change is fundamental. It is here to stay. But we also know very well that health and well-being has many, many forms. And that we're talking about mental health within the prism of total health is each our responsibility, each our right, each our necessity to survive day to day. So thank you for joining us and please do your part in promoting psychological well-being, emotional stability, and prosperity for those for the, for yourselves, those your loved ones and those that you work with here and across the globe. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you all so much, really appreciate it.